So, um, look, we're going to invite questions. We're just going to get the conversation started, and um, and then we're going to invite questions from you know, from the um, audience as well. So, look, probably to start off with Chels. Chels, like you've done a lot of work with traditional ecological knowledge, and you know you're highly accomplished in the Western science, and you know you've been on advisory panels to federal government and state government, um, and. Um, just wondering around about the, the melding of, of how we're, you know, moving forward with Indigenous science and how we use that at the forefront of what we're doing, but at the same time recognising that we've been swallowed up in a lot of ways by the Indigenous science and, you know, how we work about that into the future, particularly in when we talk about what's happening in the Bellinger. You know, there's lots of different things happening, whether it's, um, um, you know, national parks and, um, you know, effects on riverways and, you know, obviously your, your area's marine science as well. So just wanted to hear a bit more about the work that you're doing in terms of traditional ecological knowledge and, yeah, share that with the mob here. Thanks, Nathan. I think you're pretty legendary, bro. <laughs> um, yeah, look, thanks for the opportunity to speak here uh, this evening. Um, and thank you to the organisers for... Um, giving uh, Gumbangi people a, a voice um, in Bellingen. Um, I work in a, in a lab um, that looks at uh, using uh, indigenous metaphysics um, in looking at solutions um, that could be applied to um, our world uh, issues and problems. Um, in doing that, uh, it's basically looking um, at uh, deep, deep, thought and deep diving into, I suppose, the paradigms of Indigenous knowledge and, and what those metaphysics look like. Um, one of the components or areas is looking at, uh, like, Indigenous knowledge systems, uh, which some people will call First Nations science, um, some people call it uh, traditional ecological knowledge, uh, Indigenous knowledge systems, uh, Indigenous knowledge, uh, the list goes on and on. Um, but essentially it's looking at those uh, systematic uh, processes on, on observation and learning and then adaptation uh, that comes out of that, which is the same sort of metaphysics as we use in current day Western science. Um, so you're looking at a, a, um, a could be a behaviour, it could be an issue in the environment or in any sort of social construct. You're learning through observation uh, you're then applying your hypotheses or what you think is going on and then you're having a look further and then developing, you know, your um, observer's um, outcome or a solution or a process to, uh, to what your hypothesis is. Um, so with Indigenous knowledge, you know, we all know that uh, Indigenous knowledge has, has, has been existing, you know, uh, for more than 60,000 up to 80,000 years. So a lot of that knowledge, um, I, <laughs> I, I tend to call it, you know, that um, Aboriginal people are the inventors of the cloud. Um, so it's like the cloud, if you can relate to the cloud, uh, the knowledge um, that is uh, um, developed and learnt and, and retained is then embedded in, in country and the landscape. Um, so that's embedded in things like storyline, uh, it's embedded in things like uh, totes, totems, uh, it's embedded in things like kinship and relationships with other species and animals. Um, it's those uh, metaphysics um, of your, uh, I suppose, the foundations of your worldview and perspective that have essentially seen Aboriginal people move through a lot of these hardships and still retain um, culture. Um, all those components um, then go into this dialogue which is like culture and behaviour. Um, and that culture and behaviour is actually really and truly embedded and attached to nature, the environment and biodiversity. So in a nutshell, when you talk about biodiversity, you talk about our culture. Yeah, makes sense? Cool. Thanks for hanging with me through all that. <laughs> it's a bit epic. Um, so, in, 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 in using that in current day context, you know, uh, you know we talk about this thing uh, around sovereignty and a lot of people freak out and go, ooh, does that mean that Aboriginal people are going to, you know, take over or have their own sort of jurisdiction with our ju jurisdiction so it then becomes like this whole uh, paradigm in power play and power shifting. 
And it sort of is, but sovereignty is about, you know, essentially uh, putting uh, First Nations science or Indigenous knowledge systems um, in primacy. So we're looking at that um, at, at the same uh, equity um, as Western science. So there's, you know, our, our last scientific revolution was, you know, way back in like the 1700s. And you know, I often speak to other scientists and say, look, you know, are we ready for another you know, scientific revolution? And you know, a lot of those scientists do answer with yes, um, because we're at the point where we're running out of these um, solutions and approaches to our environmental problems, uh, especially in the face of climate change, where we have that uncertainty attached to it. Um, and I always say, you know, and, and I believe that one of the ministers stole my words, actually, is that you know, when you are dealt with a problem in your workshop, um, you have a limited about amount of tools. Some of your tools are broken. You throw those tools out or you try to fix them. And if there's a new tool that comes along that does a really good job at exactly the same approach, will you use it? So Indigenous Knowledge Systems is just like a, a very old tool but brought forward into a modern context and utilised as another tool in that toolbox. Yeah? Thanks for staying with me during that bit. Um, yeah, we, we, we're going deep. We're going through the whole thing here, so just stick with me. <laughs> it'll, it'll poke through the other end. So with that, you know, one of the key things is about, okay, well, uh, where, where is this place? Where is this place in society and where is this place in science for Indigenous knowledge systems? At the moment, it's not there. But it is there, sort of. So in one particular piece of legislation, which is the Conservation Biodiversity Act, there's a component in the key principles that clearly states, um, you know, to, I don't know what the exact words is, I should, probably should, but sorry, um, that, you know, basically to use, uh, embed um, and facilitate um, Indigenous knowledge in biodiversity management. So it's out of those realms that, you know, we decided that, you know, we are custodians of Storyline and we are custodians of koala um, and many other species on Gumbangi country. Um, and, you know, rather than constantly being fed and this other paradigm, um, let's have a look at what ours looks like in a local, uh, a regional scale. And that was the uh, foundations for the koala plan. And as you just seen then, it's actually attached to a koala story. Um, and the koala story just happens to be about climate change. Um, <laughs> so, you know, when we first approached government and we were, you know, talking to them about, you know, the koala, uh, the quoll, the blue groper, the shark, you know, they're sort of starting to freak out... Uh, I remember the minister's face at the time, his face like, oh, what are these things got to do with koala? But essentially they're the holistic components of our you manage a species. So I always say to people, you know, you, you, you save a koala, you save a forest, you save a whole ecosystem. So, you know, our approach is a little bit different um, and it's coming from, a, that's because it's coming from different metaphysics and it's coming from different paradigms in, in thought, approach and behaviour. Yeah. Um, so with those uh, things in context, uh, you know, we're hoping that we do get community support to implement um, this plan and many other plans uh, that we're starting to develop in relation to sea country as well. So I think you guys all um, are aware that in Gumbangi country, uh, the ocean is our totem. So as Gumbangi people and as people that are living on Gumbangi country, we all have an obligation as a um, you know, as a custodian or a caretaker to make sure that these systematics and these functions and these environmental functions are healthy, operational and thriving. And thriving being the key word. Um, so, I don't know if I run out of things to no, say, have no. I been going on and on? <laughs> Mate, in my meetings, like, yeah, the mob usually tell me to shut up by now. <laughs> um... So, yeah, um, look, and, and at the moment I, I am working uh, with the uh, Australian um, IUCN and the United Nations in, in looking at, uh, in Australia, how, how we give equity to science and how we give equity to knowledge systems 
and how do we give equity to Aboriginal people and our, um, our knowledge systems. Um, and, you know, <laughs> when you talk to geneticists, they sort of go, ugh. Yeah, that's got nothing to do with us. And it's like, well, yeah, it does. Um, so, you know, one component there that I can give an example of is like, you know, with the koala plan, there's a lot of genetic work going on um, and trying to sort out some of the, the, the problems uh, with interbreeding um, in koalas that have got small populations. So one pr process of this is, is, you know, the poking and prodding of uh, kin... And, and I'm hoping you guys um, understand what kin is. So that kinship relationship is where you see other forms and other living entities as equal to yourself. So as a human, you're not putting on your human or human-centric perspective on everything that's above everything else. So everything is, is equal in that form. So for Aboriginal people in Gambanga country, we go on this notion of have being... Um, uh, ecocentric, which makes you level with every other living form um, in in that paradigm, yeah, and in that system. So as that system, you know, Aboriginal people and Gambangi people, our role has always been in basically observers and watchers and making sure that country is healthy and functioning and thriving. Um, and as Michelo just explained earlier, a lot of that role and responsibility was taken away from us. And you know, due to that, you've had 238 years of mismanagement of country in Australia, and especially mismanagement of country here in Gumbangi country. Um, so what we're hoping when we talk about sovereignty is basically let's have a look at our cultural paradigms and our ways of knowing, doing and thinking you know, as primacy in that space. So we're having a look at a different system, we're having a look at a different worldview and we're not doing the same old, same old, same old thing. We're inserting something that was here for the last 60,000 years and we're having a look at how that operates in a modern day context. Yeah, yeah deadly Charles, that's great. Thank you. Look. Yeah, and I, actually I remember being in a meeting a couple of months ago with a group of scientists in, in the koala, um, whatever, what, what department were they, Chelsea, the um, science team for koalas, and Chelsea was talking about song lines and like, where's this story going? And she goes, look, just shut the F up and just listen and you'll see where it's going. But she was talking about the song lines and how those song lines travel with genetics as well. So the koala genetics travel with our song lines that travel through the country. And then he was like, oh, understand what you're talking about now so you know so those are the it's really amazing how Chelsea can relay that so yeah we always get a big aha moments you know when we're with western scientists um but anyway um thanks a heap Chelsea. that was awesome and look reese i guess for you brother look you're, you're in the cultural fire space and that's something that you know i've seen your um in action on the cultural fire ground you know you've you've, you've got lots of experience as a firefighter yeah, and doing now moving into the cultural burning space, I suppose for everyone here, what is, you know, what's the difference between cultural fire and, you know, um, hazard reduction burning and all that sort of stuff. But yeah, if we can, there's probably some people that haven't probably know the whole concept of cultural fire and how our people used it as a tool for 60,000 years, 80,000 years. All right, thank you. Um, it's a very in-depth question. So cultural fire is very complex and it can be uh, many things. Uh, it can be sitting around having a yarn, cooking a food. It's all about intention. So with, uh, with a hazard reduction burn, you know, it, it's a, it's a Western, Western fire regime that's usually put in the landscape for protecting assets, basically. It's, you know, round towns, communication, power lines, that kind of thing. But for us, for Aboriginal people putting fire on country, it's really important and it's, it's, it's the intention that you're there for. We've got that, that kinship and that relationship that Chels spoke about. That is integral. You know, we're, we're looking at everything from a holistic point of view. We're understanding seasons, animal movements, the water, water relationships with fire. So, so we're going out on the country to burn and country's going to tell us when it's ready. So we need to be able to read country. We need to understand what's going on in that landscape. And it is about landscapes. 
So it's all good, you know, Chels burning her little block and, block and me burning mine, but we need to come together as a community and look at landscapes as a whole and how we're going to put fire on that country. Um, <laughs> look, um, yeah, yeah, no, it's all good. Um, there's just a lot going on and there's a lot to talk about. I'm really passionate about fire and, and to me country is the best classroom there is. You know, the lessons you learn from country, it, it's just mind-boggling. Those little relationships between insects and lizards and birds and things that are flowering and so we're, we're looking at that. We're looking at that whole picture. We're, we're going there with informed decisions. We want to make informed decisions. Yeah, um, thanks a heap, Reese. Um, so yeah, a, a look, I guess just to back on with, with what Chelsea said, you know, we're, we're in the process of revitalising our, our knowledge systems. And so there has been a tide that has turned where the Western science has swallowed up our knowledges. And look, and me and Chelsea have lots of yarns about the Western science. Um, and it's about how we view those relationships. There's quite a power dynamic imbalance that we need to recheck. And so when we talk a lot about the environment, like I think about, you know, no one likes speaking of the word, but we think about the institutional, sometimes racism that we have to deal with, with environmental space, because, you know, you've got ecologists and Western scientists, you know, thinking that they know better, you know, and I, I always use the example. So 20% um, of the world's land mass is held by indigenous people, but 80% of the world's biodiversity sits on Indigenous land. Over 50% of Australia's national reserve system is Indigenous land. So, so that's something that the Western science, you know, despite all their universities and, you know, everything else and ecologists, you know, we haven't been able to turn the tide in what's been happening with our country. I guess, you know, the, the, coinc the thing that's coincided with the decline of our ecosystems has been the removal of Aboriginal people off our country. And, and I say, if I showed you a, um, a graph of a decline of Aboriginal people being removed off country, loss of language, loss of story, all that sort of stuff, and I put up a graph of the loss of ecosystems, it would be the exact same traje trajectory. And that's why I do the work that I do with the Freedom School, with the Gumbang Yira Gingana Freedom School. It's about bringing back that language. It's about bringing back that knowledge because, and bringing back our custodianship of country. Because I know that, you know, by making that trajectory go up again, that we're going to have see that trajectory naturally happen with our ecosystems as well. So, um, you know, that's a huge issue that we that we deal about and talk about all the time. So um, we're going to break at 4.30, but we're going to open it up for any kind of questions from the from the floor for Chels, Reese, or myself um, around Indigenous knowledges. So um, do we have any questions from, from any of the community? Uh, Rhys, um, question, um, where you've got forest that hasn't had fire through it around here for 20, 30 years and it's all a regrowth forest, where do you start? Like it has a huge fuel load and whatever, so. So it is about making a start and we need to make a start. I guess, um, you know, on the project I've been working on, we've been trying to pick the good safe burns, you know, we really want to show the knowledge it, that we still have within community to add fire to country and, and manage fire on country, and it's about being given a chance. But you're right, you know, th those big fires that in 2019-20, we've got a big wedge of unburnt country here that never got burnt, high biodiverse, biodiversity values, and really a couple more years of drying and that's, that's ready to, to go again. So we really need to be mindful of getting fire on country. And, and when you know that the answer's there, you know, we, we shouldn't have seen fires like we've seen in the past. That, that just shouldn't happen. And it's from lack of people on country and a lack of fire on country. So really, as Aboriginal people, we want to be able to get access back to land, work within communities, and, and meet our cultural obligation to care for country. Any 
more questions from the audience? Thanks. Hi. Thank you to all of you. Um, I just want to address another question to Rhys. With the work that you're doing, are you finding that there is... Um, are you getting resistance from government bodies or from fire management bodies? Is there an openness or is this just lip service at this point? <laughs> so, look, um, we are getting support, but, but once again, it's, it's a bit, bit of token value from, from governments. Um, we're, we're finding it hard with insurances. We're still having to work within, you know, with other government agencies, Rural Fire Service, National Parks Fire and Rescue. We still have to rely, you know, on, on those agencies to get things done. We're at the stage where we need to build capacity with our own communities. So that's sort of where we're at, is really trying to bring that knowledge and skills up within community. And we're getting a lot of really positive feedback and a lot of interest from private landowners wanting to let Gumbanga people back on country to help manage with fire. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah, and, and letting us back on country is a really awesome mutual relationship because then, you know, there's, there's, we can have access to some of our special places that we don't have access to. So, you know, there's that real shared value um, with, with many of our community, like, with that opportunity and I use the example down at Valor, we look from the road from Sullivan's Road to a beautiful site that's at the bottom of Normal Middle where where um, Gongan and, and Burrigan camped and you know we're not allowed onto that property so we look at it from the road but you know we really want to have those relationships with private landholders so we can take our children over there instead of looking from the road you know almost getting hit by cars you know and saying there's where Burrigan and, and, and Gongan camp where that red ochre fell from that from that um, little the little pole in their tent and made that water special water hole. So, um, Goa Miklo knows that one well, eh? I took a, I took a group of people there one time to have a look at Gongwin's uh, Miral, the <coughs> and um, the the guy that owned the place it said it was all right to go on there before or. or it, and then we went back again and he said, no, we, you can't go on that, on that land to go across and uh, see your sacred place. Um, he was worried that there was a, a, a carved tree there that we were going to make a claim on his land. Um, you know, all we want to do is go and uh, see our old places and, uh, yeah, visit the uh, ancestors. Uh, was there a question down the front? Um, oh, we've got another one. Don't be scared, people. You, you've got a chance to use, like, four black series here. Uh, noting um, that uh, we're going to be singing at 4.30, dinner's at 5, um, and, uh, um, and, and we're going to come back. These brilliant, brilliant guys are going to be coming back, and then we can bombard them with questions and a way to go forward and how to look after this country, all with, with, with the Gumbangir people out front. Um, do you have time for one question now? Yeah. Um, so mine's about place names. I think I find that really interesting. Um, you know, what we call places and like, you know, after Explorer dudes that came not that long ago. And just wondering about, yeah, change, you know, the change of place names. That's something that I want to start doing and I think we need to start doing. And like a... A significant feature, obviously, for our area is um, old man sleeping. And I've always been unsure of how to refer to that and other place names and just wanted to know what's, what is the best way in this space and what is the best way, you know, for old man sleeping to refer to, to that feature. Yeah, I'll, I'll speak a little bit to that. Um, so, so, yeah, obviously, you know, lots of... Places have gum, derived from Gumbengira words, so Bellingen, Balagen, these and Kual. Um, so um, I guess, you know, it's about getting community to support when it comes to changing names because it's actually got to go through a government process. It's not easy to change a name of anything, you know. So it's easier to, um, it's actually really hard to change the name of a town. So we probably need to um, look at different strategies in terms of how we're going to go about that. So names of mountains, names of rivers are a bit easier than changing a town. So, and usually you need lots of community support that 
write submissions to what we call the New South Wales Geographical Names Board. And so there's got to be a whole consultation phase that goes through that, you know. How do we how do we do that with the community? How do we make submissions to the Geographical Names Board? You know, is there a written history of a name for that particular place? So um, a lot of areas around here were written down by a man named Gerhard Laves. So we've got the historical records um, from the 1930s to say that these are all, the, all these names. So there is a bit of a process to it and particularly when you talk about things like you know Major's point which is you know Major come into that region you know a couple of hundred years ago killed a lot of Aboriginal people to put all these cattle um, you know up in that part of the range so um, that there was actually a few years ago talk of changing the name of Coots Crossing which is you know was a bit of a challenge with the community they actually because Coots the property owner had poisoned Goombangira people you know um, lace flour with with something arsenic and so um, and so a lot of the community wanted to change that name but there was quite a lot of pushback so you know there's there's strategies about how you can do that so it's things like dual signage so that place we call Coots Crossing we call it Darm Mirau so you know we might put up a sign just loosely saying Darm Mirau and it's kind of like Uluru like 20 years ago no one called Uluru Uluru it was as rock and over time so the attitudes change you know when people see that name and that sign that becomes really prominent and that's how we make the change you know over time you know it's been done in other areas really significant areas so i think you know it's one step at a time and we look at things like just dual signage so it could be even at the start of bellingen we put the actual spelling of the name in gumbangira and then you know over time that might change that name so and then the geographical names board might change it so it's about changing attitudes and ed education as well and we can do it. Yes, we can do it. Um, now, Gungumbu, Yilaminda, Yilaminda Gungumbu.